Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hero Movie Podcast, your greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. I'm your host, Adam Portress, and joining me today, there is no one more mad that the name Sloth Baby Productions is no longer available, and the man who relates mostly to the father that embarrasses his children, Bruce Leslie. I'm a prickly pear with a passion for cosplay contests, Mm. and you're right, man, my heart broke. For Papa there when when Abu I think she called him when when she didn't want to go as Little Hulk and Big Hulk because oh. man it was his time to shine oh man oh man but uh, we are back everybody and we are talking Miss Marvel now uh, for those of you out there that listen to not only this show but all the other shows that we uh, do uh, we've been doing Marvel thirty questions shows. Uh, for all of the Marvel series so far, but Miss Marvel is one that we're kind of skipping uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, we're still in the middle of Obi Wan thirty questions and doing th- two thirty question shows, then this show, then the Dinger Zone. Uh, we only have so much time it's in our week, uh, so we had to kind of make some decisions and everything. And uh, Miss Marvel was one that was going to go in that slot just because, hey. Uh, th- you know, three guys in their 40s talking about high school girl stuff is is a little strange. So we figure, hey, we're still going to watch it because, you know, it's it's Marvel. And uh, it, honestly, it looked interesting enough. So I was like, well, we'll certainly give it a shot. We're going to talk about the pilot episode uh, that dropped this week. And then I think once the series uh, winds up and everything, we'll do a big kind of recap of what we thought of the entire season. Yeah. Because I'll just go ahead and just give you a quick sneak preview I kind of I I liked it more than I've than I than I initially had thought I would, Bruce. It was different than I expected. Yeah, exactly. Then I think that's one of the things that made me like it. It was like it's different than what we've got so far uh, with the Marvel series, and they've kind of kept them very unique and different as they go along. But we'll talk about all of that fun stuff. But before we do, we do want to say a big giant thank you to those who support us over at Patreon.com slash HMP. Doesn't matter what your level support your show at, your pre-show, post-show, dinger zone. And since Sean is not here this week, uh, he is on assignment uh Keep it quiet. Keep it under your hat. Cracker Factory business. It's none of never you mind. Uh, but he will be back. Do, do don't don't worry though. Don't worry. We still got a Stallone connection from from the man himself. So you know, fear not. Uh, but where was I going with this? Uh, thank you, Patreon supporters. It's all the Patreon new, people. No nickname because uh, Sean's out. Yes, we, yeah, exactly. We have a we have a no new nicknames this week. We because we do have a new one. Uh, but we want to encourage you also to go to patreon.com slash HMP. We will get you an HMP nickname as well next week when Sean is in. That was our plan this week, but we're, we're going to push it back for one more. So uh, we're going to get you a, a heck of a name. consist of things that are just sitting on my desk at the time, like thumbtack or coffee mug. So, yeah, it's always better if Sean's around. Yeah, no one's going to be like, I'm Jason Coffee Mug. That's not going to get you any respect uh, <laughs> down at the office. Thumbtack Johnson. <laughs> He sticks around. Um, but so if you'd like to get uh, one of those fancy HMP nicknames, pre show, post show, dinger zone, and all that kind of good stuff, head on over to patreon.com slash HMP and uh, join up today. We'd like to uh, just say again, big thank you to all of you fine, fine people. And uh, it means a lot. It means a lot. And it's uh, it's so great to see uh, you guys out there supporting this show. Uh, and of course, if you can't afford a show, go over to, uh, you know, review us on iTunes. Give us a five star review, AKA Humdinger. Um, dinger. I see. I just want to give you a shot every now and then. You know, you're good. You're <laughs> yeah. a good guy. Why, why? Why can't we give you a shot? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, as we said uh, this week, we are covering Miss Marvel. So here is the trailer for Miss Marvel. Okay. So first off, I just want to say, I get it. You get what? High school. Kamala. Kamala. Another adventure shirt. Cute. She thinks I'm some kind of weirdo. You were a weirdo. Boys. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> you're kind of on my shirt. Sorry. But you're staring out the window in your little fantasy land. Kamala. Hey. Already? Really? Come on. Like. Do I have to figure out my whole future before launchers? 
It's for like... Maybe they're right. I spend too much time in fantasy land. That is not to you. It's not really the brown girls from Jersey City who save the world. That's a fantasy too. Did something happen to you? You know why? Did you hear something? Come on, love. What does it feel like? Cosmic. I always thought I wanted this kind of life. But I never imagined any of this. Do you even know what you are? I'm a superhero. Alrighty, that was the trailer. For Ms. Marvel, uh, first episode currently streaming on Disney Plus right now. You know what time it is. It's time for Bruce's comic book connection. Bruce, what do you got? Kamala Khan was created by writer G. Willow Wilson, along with a crew of Marvel writers and editors. But her first appearance was a sneaky one in a comic written by Kelly Sudakonic. Because in Captain Marvel number 14, there's a young woman who would become Ms. Marvel, and she's in a very deliberately placed in a position where she sees Carol Danvers protecting civilians from Yon Rog. And Khan idolizes Carol, so when Kamala Khan acquires superhuman abilities, she emulates Carol Danvers. And, of course, in the comic book continuity, Danvers was Ms. Marvel for years before becoming Captain Marvel, so it made for a great legacy character when Kamala took up the moniker. And I'm going to probably go back and forth on how I say her name because I'm thinking of our vice president's pronunciation. Uh, who, who, by the way, she, even even Kamala Harris goes back and forth on her own pronunciation. Okay, well, so. the, the comic book character, it's been a established as Kamala, not Kamala, but I just can't help it. Sometimes I say the, say the name wrong. So I apologize to anyone who doesn't uh, appreciate that. I'm sorry. It's my weakness. But how did she get her powers in the comics? Back on topic. And what are her powers in the comics? Well, the answer to both of these questions is, well, it's different than the Disney Plus series <laughs> because <laughs> Kamala Khan is one of several characters who discovered that they have inhuman heritage following the inhumanity storyline in which Terrigen mists are released throughout the world and they activate dormant inhuman cells. So these Terrigen mists give Kamala Khan the ability to be elastic, plastic and stretchy, kind of like Mr. Fantastic, but not exactly. She also got superhuman strength and durability along with the healing factor. And overall, it made her a pretty potent hero. But what about the writer, G. Willow Wilson? Much like the character she created, Wilson is from New Jersey and is a Muslim woman. But unlike Kamala, Wilson's family were not immigrants and were not Muslim. Her parents were atheists who renounced Protestantism in the late 1960s. Did you see that twist coming at him? Not particularly, but... Uh, yeah. So after high school, Wilson attended Boston University, studying a number of religions, including Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. After studying Judaism, she focused on Islam, which appealed to her because, and I quote, she felt, to become a Muslim is sort of a deal between you and God, end quote. So in 2003, G. Willow Wilson moved to Cairo, and I mean Egypt, not Illinois, <laughs> and formally converted to Islam. She married an Egyptian fella, and the couple moved to Seattle, where they now have two lovely children. But I really wanted to make some kind of walk like an Egyptian joke here, but I fear that that just might be a little too culturally insensitive. And speaking of culturally insensitive, Adam, <laughs> you have a list. Uh, if that comic book connection wasn't enough for you, let me sell everybody on this new Disney Plus show because this sucker's got anything. You ever spend any time in Atlanta? We'll play our new favorite game. Hey, I know where that is. <laughs> you mean that's not Jersey City? <laughs> no, there's a, like, I, uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, yes. We've got wild colors, cut out animation, a lead that is indeed indelible. We've got overprotective parents, a kid that makes gadgets named Bruno, classic bullies, kids with way more friends than I ever had in high school. Uh, Scott Lang has a podcast, Mulan, animated graffiti, Little Hulk, Big Hulk, a fancy bracelet, sneaking out, Avengers Con, Giant Man, Head Roll, Giant Thor, Hammer Flying, uh, 
uh, light hands, body glowing, light shooting, uh, reverse car slamming, a uh, will they, won't they that you actually care about, and a show that actually feels like a fresh, a breath of fresh air from the uh, Marvel Disney uh, pa- uh, Patreon. Pa- what did I write there? Pantheon? Why? Did, well, Pantheon. I must. I must have been on something when I wrote that word. Uh, this show's got everything. <laughs> Pantheon. What? What a stupid. I. Do, I shouldn't have written that. That it's was a good dumb. word. <laughs> I don't know if it fits though. That's the problem. It's a good oh, word. Well. I don't know if it goes it, there though. It fits if you just insist it does long enough that the definition of the word changes to suit you. Uh, hey, listen. There's. <laughs> that's there happened many quite a lot. Do that. Just that. <laughs> hey, that's I'll just why keep you regardless is now in the dictionary. Oh my word! What a world we live in. <laughs> Did you know anything about this before? Because like I don't even know that I fully watch. I may have watched that initial teaser trailer once, but like I, I knew two things. Didn't really I remember knew, anything. I knew the casting for Kamala. Mm-hmm. You know, they they put her picture out on Twitter and stuff, and she looked like an uh, an adorable young woman, age appropriate, looked like a perfect choice in my opinion. Doesn't exactly look like a doppelganger of the comics version, but no. she looks like a more real version of the comics version that makes and and that was something that i i I knew as well as like when i i'd kind of seen her picture and stuff and you you couldn't help but see her in promos and things like that and like i i'd never seen her act in anything so i had zero reference there i'm like okay you know cute looking kid let's let's see what goes Yeah, I, i like it i mean cute is a good term because she's a little shorter than kamala appears in the comics she's a little rounder than Kamala appears in the comics so so she's a little more real world I she, guess and exactly I like that. exactly as a, as a parent you know it's like oh you just want to p- pinch her cheeks and and to ask her how her grades are and, you know what I mean it's like yeah grammar. and honestly I think let's let's just start it here I think this whole show lives or dies on the actor that is in here and based on this episode so far I love this girl I think she is really she has this believability about her. She doesn't feel like a, a kind of a fake phony actory kind of thing. She, she kind of seems like they found their, their female Tom Holland here for this role. I could see her having the same impact on a lot of young women that Tom Holland's casting a Spider-Man had on my sons. Yeah. Hey, how, how so? And she's Elaborate. also a massive fan. I watched a little bit of a, a, a very short behind the scenes documentary and she was a comic book fan before uh, before Miss Marvel Kamala Khan comic even came out. Huh. And when she first saw it, she bought it, fell in love with it, made her own homemade Miss Marvel suit to wear to school when she was in middle school. And <laughs> you know, the, the Miss Marvel has like that stylized lightning bolt on her chest. Yeah. Yeah. All the kids at school, even though she's wearing like this Pakistani inspired, sorry, kind of, uh, suit of clothing people asked her if she was supposed to be the flash so she you know <laughs> got a kick out of that. somebody probably asked her if she was shazam but she didn't say that out loud but anyway <laughs> what so, those kids don't know who shazam is they barely know who the flash is come on now so it's the it's every child's dream of getting cast to play your favorite superhero you yeah know, it's just like tom holland got to play his favorite superhero spider-man she gets to play her favorite superhero. So well, that's kind of wild that like it's awesome. like it's life imitating art imitating life imitating art. <laughs> like we're going exactly. in a circle here because this girl <laughs> is now getting to play. It could cause as she gets older to like have like a mental breakdown where she can't remember who's real. Oh, to, <laughs> which is the real one and which is the, the fictional one. But anyway, when I was a child, I, I dreamed of a world and it came true and it kept on happening. So I don't know where I am or what's real anymore. It reminds me of when my son said he only wanted to be in a play. If he could play a wizard, he got cast as Harry Potter in the first play. (laughs) Anyway, so the second thing I knew about it was that her powers were changed from the comics because they didn't want them to be too similar to Reed Richards, which gets Fantastic Four fans excited. That means that we're rapidly approaching Reed Richards. Well, I don't know. Hopefully they weren't just saying because of the appearance of Reed Richards in a recent movie. No, but, that shouldn't uh, be. I wouldn't think. I, I don't. I mean, I, I don't know that that's a problem. Like, is anybody going to get confused and say, "Wait, which one's Reed Richards again? Which one is <laughs> Fanny Girl?" I mean, well, I you also know how it. dumb people are as well, and like, there will be like, there will be the conversation that would be had of like, "Well, no, Miss Marvel was the first per- first character to do it," and you're like, "This character was created sixty years before this character exists. What are you talking about?" 
kind of but, like those arguments will happen because it's the internet. Yeah. But. So I, I didn't think it was necessary to change your powers. I think there's probably more to it. I think that they also maybe change the powers for budget reasons or something. Like I figured there's more to it than just the Reed Richards thing, but maybe there isn't, but those are the two things I knew going into it. Mm-hmm. And other than that, it was uh tabula rasa. Yeah. I was, um, I, I was surprised at, um, again, Thankfully, with the Marvel television and stuff, every sort of new thing that we get from WandaVision, Loki, all of that stuff, uh, it's visually changed in a very satisfying way. Uh, I None of these, while a lot of our Star Wars stuff kind of is starting to feel a little samey, uh, yeah. the Marvel shows don't, this one is, uh, specifically does not feel samey at all. If anything, it feels more like Spider, the last three Spider-Man movies than it does, you know, any of the other Marvel television stuff. And also like the absent Sean always likes to tell us things like different Marvel movies are trying to make different sort of genre films, right? Like mm-hmm. you got your noir, you got your spy thriller, you've got this, you got that. I think that this is the first actual Disney show. Like, I think that something mm-hmm. I wasn't expecting, and I don't consider it a negative, but it's going to turn a lot of people off. This show is already getting like review bombed. It's, it's getting people that are speaking out against it just because they're offended that it exists rather than having a problem with any actual details. <laughs> but you're, a lot of people were tuning in to expect an MCU show and they got, I think a Disney show. I think this has a lot more in common with something like Kirby buckets or like the diary of a wimpy kid movies or uh, maybe even like Harvey Danger a little bit. Like I watched a lot of those shows with my kids as they were growing up. And this is a show that really has the feel of shows made for middle school kids more than any other age group. And it's got like the animated stuff going on on the walls in the background. That's kind of a thing that that higher budget Disney uh, shows, Disney XD shows, live action Nickelodeon shows might do. Hmm. And this is like one of those Disney Channel live action originals. Like, I get confused. I don't know what's on Nickelodeon. Like, I don't know where's Wizards of Waverly Place. It's like a high budget version of that. So, I don't know if that's Disney Plus, Disney XD. I don't know, but this is like a high budget version of one of those kind of shows. Better writing, better directing, better cinematography. But still, this is the first one of these Marvel tie ins that I feel like this is a Disney Plus show that ties into Marvel, not a Marvel show that ties into Disney Plus. Well, let me ask you then, uh, with that following up, because, you know, more or less, I I guess, depending upon like what, how is your, is your daughter interested in this show at all? Because I feel like she's about the age or maybe Uh, obviously a little younger, maybe. The the problem is these shows appeal to people that are just a little younger than the characters that are being depicted. Mm -hmm. Like, like as much as people say they want to watch shows about people their own age, the thing is middle school kids like to watch shows about high school kids, high school kids like to watch college yeah, kids, that's fair. college that's fair. kids like to watch friends. You know how that goes. Yeah. So she's being 16, being a junior in high school. She's almost might think, you know, going through a phase where she might think she's too cool for this. She, she hasn't said a word to me about it. I'm yeah. just speculating. Uh, but if she ever watches this, she might love it. She might not. I don't know. But you know, a show has a right to be uh, a, a show made for middle school kids like yeah. like middle school, like you you can say that this show isn't made for me and move on you don't have to like say that shows for middle school kids don't have a right to exist and i feel like that yeah, that's a little people. much but but honestly i think that's what some people are going to do say this is terrible because it's made for kids but you know what comic books used to be made for kids yeah exactly and and that's and, one and of the marvel in particular kamala khan's trade paperbacks and comics really really are impactful with younger readers more than a lot of the other stuff from marvel and, and we we've said that for some time with this is that at some point they were going to get with marvel and star wars uh shows you're going to get to the point where um there's not gonna there's gonna be a show that's just not for you if, if that's yeah. this show, then you don't have to watch this show. You can still work with all it, of the other stuff. And like it, it's it's becoming more of a like when oh when you had the big issue crossovers and stuff, right? Big giant book events like Secret Invasion where you could you could go and buy every comic in the line to 100 yeah. percent the storyline and stuff. But there would be stuff you don't want to buy that issue of Hercules because why? Why do I need that issue of Hercules? Yep. No, throw Same that idea out. with Secret Wars. You could. Uh, pick up what you like and forget the rest. 
Exactly. And uh, you know, su- even the death of Superman was that way, dude. <laughs> they had so many because it was it was a time, baby. We, we would just go and get everything. If it had some sort of a there was like a funeral for a friend series that had like eight or nine books or something yeah, going across just, all of the things. And it and like because of the way that they labeled them, you had to go get them. Because it was just like you'd be like one of eight or something <laughs> like that. And you'd be like, well, I, I got to go get all of them. So you end up with a, like a book you would never in a bazillion years pretty, read. Yeah, pretty ridiculous setup. And you don't know how to put it in any sort of collection. You're just like, where did, where does this like rogue turd go? <laughs> Perfect term for it. But yeah, and, and also just from uh, an industry perspective, both the comic book industry and the multimedia industry, you got to throw a few things out there on the edges. You got to widen that net and you're always, you always need to try to capture more people. You can't just necessarily, I mean, some franchises can play to their base, but multi-billion dollar franchises can't afford to just play to their base. You know, you've always <laughs> got to be nipping around the edges and they did, you know, they did exactly that to great success with, uh, uh, Captain Marvel, the movie and with black Panther, the movie. So I'm, I think that this is a show that is definitely going to have its detractors, just like the Captain Marvel movie and the Black Panther movie did. Uh, maybe it's fan base because it is aimed at a younger audience. Its fan base will probably not be as large as that for something like uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. But I think there's going to be a level of loyalty. Like people are going to fall in love with this character. Uh, to the people that this show is in their wheelhouse, there's no other show like it in their wheelhouse. So they're going to love this. Yeah, it's it is a little like like I said, it's it's different and crazy enough, and that's to me the cool thing is that, like you said, it is kind of we'll say we'll put them in the middle school plus middle school to like maybe early high school range of kids is where we're kind then, of you know programming I people, this. I think people will start to get back into it around twenty three or twenty four when they're like, oh my god, when I was a kid, that's how I felt, you know. But mm-hmm. you, you gotta you gotta like get through that too cool for school attitude and then circle back around. Yeah, I I, th- I think a lot of the, like, it, but there's enough in there as well that doesn't it um it does the smart Disney thing that you know Disney and Pixar do is like hey we've made this thing for children but we're also yeah. not going to you know make the adults want to shoot themselves in the head out of you know tedium and everything it, we're going to make it interesting enough we're going to have a good enough story and really. Uh, that's that's what I think is ultimately behind this thing. Is like if if you've got an interesting enough story, and really to me the lead is what kind of sells this whole thing. Uh, and she's she sold me right off the bat. And okay, so I've got a couple more topics here. I want to make sure I don't forget. So we'll try to tackle them one at a time, if that's mm-hmm. okay with you. Uh, costuming from the previews that I've seen, the trailers, the the look forward, you know, to other episodes this season. It looks like it's going to be a bit like Netflix Daredevil season one, where I don't think we're going to get a proper costume reveal to the end. Mm -hmm. It looks like she's going to be wearing that Carol Danvers cosplay for a while until she, you know, eventually makes or gets or something happens for her own costume. Right. Uh, Do you have any feelings or thoughts on that? I don't. I mean, I think that's uh, I I kind of like that, actually. Um, And and you and I, we've all said it when when we went to the real daredevil costume in season two and everything, like while we all like it, I don't think any of us dislike that costume. There's some about that original, some about that OG, you know, it's like the Frank Miller one. Yeah. I still like that a whole bunch. And it's like, it almost works even better than, you know, the real daredevil costume sometimes. And, and I mean, they did go back to it in a later season. Yeah. Oh, and exactly. You know, they, they made it more Frank Miller when they went back to it, put the ropes around his hands and stuff. Oh, so good. Um, I, I there's a part of me though that just wants to see what the Miss Marvel costume is going to look like on screen. So there's a part of me that's like eager for that unveiling, and it it's looking clear to me from what I've seen they're going to stick with this cosplay costume for a while. Like I was kind of hoping, you know, she talked about putting her own spin on the costume. I was hoping she would actually show up at the costume contest as the more familiar Miss Marvel costume, but you know that's hoping a little bit too much. <laughs> and also, you know, Miss Marvel has never existed in the MCU. You know, Carol Danvers went straight to Captain Marvel. There was never a Miss Marvel until now. Whereas oh, yeah. in the comics, Carol Danvers was Miss Marvel before she was Captain Marvel. So that made Kamala Khan, the fan, Miss Marvel, like a, a legacy character. So I'm kind of curious how they're going to explain using that name and how it's going to come across here. But I am eager to see the the unveiling of the costume. And also, I got to say, as a 
person who is just seen a whole lot of cosplay, both good and bad. That cosplay that her and her friend made with zero budget is almost a little too good. Right. It's like, uh, like at first you think it's kind of cruddy, but like the more you look at it, you're like, mm, that's a lot better yeah, than it should like, be. <laughs> that's some pretty good synthetic leather that it's made out of. Like they show him uh, as if he's airbrushing it, but yeah. you can tell, no, that's actually made from fabrics. Those colors. The only part that does look a little believable is that the, the emblem is just like a drawn on a piece of cardboard and taped to the center of the chest. That part works. Mm -hmm. And then the helmet looks like it's clearly made from like cardboard or construction. Paper, yeah. But, but, but still done the really well. Visor thing in the middle. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, but it, but still it's just like, like one of those that like it's made on purpose to look a little bit, you know, crummy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's made by Hollywood costumes. Of well, yes, but I, if we're living in the world where this this girl and her uh, geeky, uh, you know, buddy I made say, one. If I were the showrunner, I would send uh, the the actress and the actor, the, the two leads home with some construction paper and say, I don't want you to come back to you've got a Captain Marvel costume. <laughs> and that's how you get authenticity, my friend. Glue sticks and a couple of, you know. <laughs> glue sticks and glow sticks. <laughs> glue sticks and glow sticks. You put together a Captain Marvel. We'll be back. We'll see you in three weeks. Pot of coffee's already made for you have at oh, the sweeted version of captain marvel <laughs> uh okay so another thing um that i wanted to ask you about is her powers in in this show because i'm not entirely sure i exactly understand what they are i know they came from this bangle this like fancy bracer bracelet thing that that she got from her auntie's her dead great aunt or something something like that out something of this relative. Box. she puts it on and it gives her power so I guess we're going to find out that her one of her female ancestors was a superhero in Pakistan and nobody knew about it or something. Maybe uh, it, it's weird because the way that she kind of once she puts that on, she uh, kind of falls backwards and goes into this kind of, you know, this purple land that that's hey, kind I've of, just finished watching Stranger Things. She goes into the upside down. Well, in a way. Yeah. But like at the same time, it looks like the same uh, place that was. Uh, that the Wakanda kind of afterlife sort of thing, that kind of purple afterworld deal. Same thing in Moon Oh, I Knight. didn't make that connection, but mm -hmm. you're right. So they, and then with all the people and stuff in the background with kind of glowy eyes and everything, like there's speculation that like, you know, that was kind of like her, like dipping into the afterworld and like, you know, whomever, you know, staring back and all that I, kind of stuff. I, I think there needs to be a Thor component. Like you have to be worthy. Cause I don't know if I like it. If just anybody who gets that bracelet, has the power no like i want um, it to be a little more personal from my understanding it, it it's they, they're probably going to explain some sort of family thing or Do like you think they will go terrigen in human kind of thing like that, that's another game? thing that i was going to ask you about i mean especially as okay spoiler alerts for dr strange i don't know why you haven't seen it at this point what's wrong with you uh but with you know black bolt being black bolt. Hmm? Yeah, Black Bolt. I was just echoing what you were saying. Yeah, with Black Bolt being there and, uh, you know, in humans and stuff being a thing, I I would not be all opposed to having, you know, us really start getting into some inhuman stuff. And I don't know that Terrigen necessarily needs to be the, you know, an actor of it all. Uh, maybe this bracelet somehow activates it. Who, who Who's to say? And they did the Terrigen thing instead of mist. It was in fish oil capsules and agents of shield. And they try to sweep most of the agents of shield under the uh, yeah. rug at this point. So I don't know if they want to bring up a term that was used there, but I do want something that makes this a little bit more personal to her and not just like, well, amazing I Spider Man, a little too. less Iron Man and a little more Spider Man. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, you don't want that Amazing Spider Man too, where it was just like, well, it was only, it was, you know, no way. That was his only DNA. He, like Peter Parker's yeah. was the only DNA that would actually work in it, and like, that's not what made Spider Man cool. Yeah. Like it, the cool part is that it could have been anybody, and it happened to be him. But like, uh, at the same time too, when you have stuff like this that works on kind of legacy and family, that that this appears that it's going down that alley that it's fine. I like it. So what do you interpret her powers to be? She creates crystals. It's a weird one. Okay. Because like part of it did look like she was shooting out crystals and stuff and everything, but there's, it's literally another part where her kind of mortal enemy, who is of course now very impressed by her uh, fancy costume and powers and all that kind of jazz, uh, catch it, catches her with what looks to be like, you know, kind of the Reed Richards like hand. Yeah, she like makes a crystal hand over her own hand, which yeah. 
obviously that's an homage to a Reed Richards powers in the comics. And it's like, why do you change the powers just to kind of make it look the same? Yeah. That's what I'm curious. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent following and it's so new now so, and she doesn't know what she's doing yeah. with them either. So, and in the nineties, I feel like we had a lot of problems because every creator wanted some creator owned superheroes and they were trying to make totally new stuff. And especially like the X-Men, they would get these weird mutant powers and it's like all the good ones have been used. So they had to keep coming up with, weirder and weirder and some that just flat out didn't make sense some that i just had bones coming out of my body you're like what yeah and and sometimes if you're going to make a new character you can still just give them some good old standby powers like it, you can write a compelling story you don't have to write the most original they character. can be you know a not, they don't have to be hypersonic uh you know vision blast how about a you know a, a, a bloom bloom sonic uh you know vision blast yeah. or some crap you know just make it like twist a couple of I, words my friend very get a thesaurus I can, <laughs> I can understand so they don't want her to have the same power as reed richards fine but at least give her a power you can explain to somebody in a couple sentences i feel like we have uh, i feel like that's a next episode uh episode two reed richards around. Reed Richards' power, he's stretchy. Superman's power, he's strong. He can fly, has X-ray vision. Uh, uh, this TV version of Miss Marvel, well, she can sort of use a bangle to form these crystal constructs, but it's not, don't confuse her with Green Lantern. <laughs> but yeah. honestly, if they just made it a Green Lantern power, I could understand it better. I, I think that's what it's going to, if I'm to venture a guess based upon what I've seen so far, I think it's going to be more more towards Green Lantern than than obviously Reed Richards. And Kevin Feige has uh, said, you know, he's after the first episode, they had this little five minute behind the scenes documentary. Did you watch that? I did not. So Kevin Feige did say that she will be appearing in the next Captain Marvel movie, which I think is called Marvel's. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be Captain Marvel and Miss Marvel. And I suspect it's also going to be Monica Rambeau. Like, I think there'll be three of them. Yeah. Who, you know, anyway, she was a Miss Marvel. She was a Captain Marvel in the comics, though. Photon, I'm sure is what she'll be in the uh, movie. But anyway, so which, I which by the way, by the way, real, real quick, real quick. Um, speaking of photon, that's who the gloves are after her. So she is actually. This is the first time we've actually referred to the character photon in this show when referencing the gloves that he made for her. Oh, I didn't even pick up on that, man. Good catch, Adam. Uh, someone but, else did it for me. I thank you, Internet. But it makes me look super, super smart, and I appreciate. <laughs> so, how do you feel about the knowledge? Does it? Uh, does it change anything, anything to take, leave, or comment on, knowing that she will indeed, this actress will be portraying this character in what I suspect will be a, a cool supporting role in the next Captain Marvel movie? Oh, I mean, like, with what this character's kind of shown me already, like, and here's the thing, people, like, this is not as easy as it sounds. Like, set up a camera and then just, you know, point it at yourself. And then have the, try to look on your face as if you're looking up to somebody that you're super admiring and everything, and have it read. Have it read. It's a tough thing to do. This girl is looking up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at like this giant Captain Marvel statue and everything, and it's just like it sells all the way through. Do I want to yeah. see this character with that character on screen? You bet your bottom dollar that I do, because that girl's <laughs> gonna just sell. It. Like I, yeah. I want to see. I want to see it already. Because I she mean, is so I down so, with there's it. There's a pretty good chance that even if it's some, even if it's just like some CGI green screen uh, tomfoolery, I feel like you got to have Brie Larson show up in this in this first season. It's like even if it's just for a minute. I think so. Okay. All right. Okay. Like even if you can't get her to be on set, you get likeness rights. You have a body double. You do a little Mark Hamill as young Luke Skywalker magic. Let, let me tell you why I think you're right. You want to know why I think you're right? Why is that? Because Brie Larson has just kind of started popping up on the interwebs, on some YouTubes and stuff. Yeah. She just got on uh, Joshua Weissman's channel cooking some, uh, I don't know what the hell they made. I watched it. It was good. It was funny. Uh, and she she's, she looks super nice, super bright and everything. And you're like, ah, oh, this chick, I, I, really, I really like her. And then he did a thing on her channel and everything. She is strategically coming out, I think, right now and doing some stuff, trying to get some nice goodwill in here because she's like, she looks, she looks great. She looks great, yeah. like her interactions and everything. Because, you know, obviously, with what we remember from the first Captain Marvel, you know, press tour, there's some stuff that people are like, what's, what's the deal? But no, this looks like a complete, like, you know, 
I'm not saying that this isn't who she really is or anything, but it feels like a new Brie Larson, you know? Sure. She's getting happy and everything and like really feels like uh, she could show up in this show. <laughs> <laughs> that that's what I think. I think I think that's not bad. Now that you mentioned that, I would not be surprised if like she pops in for a, a hot second here before we go into the uh um I mean the honestly the way that they've set up the show, the way the lore for this character works, it's a bigger deal if she doesn't show up than if she does. Well, at the same time too though, I, I don't know. Like or it's got to be a post credit thing or something. Just a little a little a, a little bit of and once again, it might be a little CGI tomfoolery body double. They composite deep faker face onto somebody else, but they've got to have some some kind of thing with uh, you. Just have to. It's how this character works. Yeah, it's how our origin story plays out. But you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. Surely won't be the last. No one will ever remember that you were wrong. But if you're right, people will go like that. Bruce is a genius. Wait, no, it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody oh. remembers when you're right. They love to remind you when you're wrong. Uh, constantly. Let me tell you. Uh, what do you think of the parents? Uh, well, well, really the whole family, because we, we've got a brother as well. Yeah. The, the brother's kind of forgettable. He's, you know, he's an adult. He's off in the background. He's going off to get married. He's, he's almost like the big brother on happy days. Like at some point he's going to be off the show and they're never, never going to, but at the same time too, like, I don't know. He's like, he's a nice bounce character. And what I mean yeah. by that is like, he's that kind of buffer between her and the parents. She, he is that kind of middle side right here to just balance it out to be like they're not just being you know cruel or anything to her it is kind of our upbringing to be a little bit strict on these sort of things except for dad who actually is quite kind of sort of the opposite of that where he's just like i hey, you stop your praying. you don't have to worry about that you know it's the the way it goes sometimes is the dad's the pushover for the daughter and he's tough on the son the mom's a pushover for the son and she's tough on the daughter it's just the the stereotypical dynamic i'm not saying it's it's true in every case but you know that's a stereotypical dynamic it's a trope that definitely makes its way into fiction but it also has some echoes in the real world at least in my house yeah and, but uh and, i love the parents the brother i don't spend much time thinking about but i love the parents and this show just kind of reminds me of situations where it's like folks that actually have good loving families and, a, and an actually quite healthy home life sometimes don't appreciate it but the folks from broken families and and looking in from the outside are so envious of that like like it's a whole grass is always greener me myself coming from a broken home and and you know growing up in a away from from family a lot of the time and that kind of thing mm -hmm. i look at this and it just feels so warm and i know it's frustrating to feel confined and your parents are strict but it's also like and I don't think it's as much a problem now as it was when we were kids. But, you know, I grew up in the, the broken home era where it's like, man, it was so rare to actually have two involved parents in the house and everything's cool, you know? So mm -hmm. she's, to me, she feels really, really lucky. But I know now that there are more, uh, what you call, quote, traditional families probably than there were when we were growing up because our parents' generations were kind of um, hit it and quit it, do what I want. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> kind of generate the boomers, man. People know what we're talking about. You and Sean, both very fortunate that you're, you know, you're both parents around when you're growing up. But a lot of people in our generation didn't have that mm -hmm. experience. And like specifically with like this family now, while they're Pakistani, like, you know, I, I grew up, my mom worked in a, in a, in a cardiologist office uh, run by Indians. And so I had like, you know, a lot of, you know, Indian interactions and stuff over the years. And, uh, if you go over to an Indian household, this is this is ha like uh, no, Pakistan is not Indian. India is not Pakistan. I know that people, but and, and also you live close enough to Cherokee that you probably need to make clear you do mean like Indian from India, not Native. Yes, 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 from India. Yes, and um, it is the 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 dynamic of the parents of 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 these kids and stuff. It's just so great because it is so on point uh, on everything, especially when it comes to, you know, like religious practices and stuff like that and what the parents are expect of the children and what the children know that their parents expect of them and how they interact with things like that. All of that stuff from my experience with, you know, Indian friends and stuff like that and, and, and other, you know, Asian Pacific countries and stuff. It like, it's, it's felt very accurate to me. Also, uh, I'm not claiming to to be an expert on ethnography or to comment on how accurate or inaccurate something that I have never experienced firsthand is. But just from like the impressions that I've gotten from my friends that did grow up in Islamic households and from the co-workers I have that are Muslim, 
this family seems pretty laid back and liberal uh, from a religious standpoint. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, from family values, they're kind of strict on her. But, you, you know, they're not really restricting her dress the way that some folks that I have their students in medical school, you know, their parents. I don't know if it's their choice, the parents choice, the family choice. I don't want to try to to say uh, that there's anything right or wrong about it. But there are folks that follow sort of a strict self-imposed dress code mm-hmm. that we don't see Kamala now, following here. But, so but at the same what time, I'm trying to say is a little more relaxed than some of the uh, friends and colleagues I've I've seen in their home life. No, and while that's certainly true, there is a moment in it, again, that I think is something that, you know, it was just so special and kind of real, is she has that moment when she's looking at herself in the mirror, and she knows that eventually her parents are going to see this. That she, she knows. And she's ju- and you can tell by looking at what she's doing, she's judging what they're going to think of what she's put together. And, you know, yep. she grabs for, for, you know, the little covering and everything because she realizes, like, if this is going to be, like, there's so many neat little just sweet character moments that don't need to be there and are there and make the show so much better on account of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's got great small moments in, uh, uh, you know, I saw interviews with some of the directors and they do appear to me to be folks that maybe uh, are not born and raised in the United States. Maybe they're from different parts of the world that would have a little better perspective at these sorts of home lives. And maybe that's where some of those, those details come from. Uh, but it's uh, quite, quite good. I And again, nothing gets past these parents, too. That's that's another thing. <laughs> that I've always found out is like the best parents are the ones that you can't get anything past because I thought I would be able to get away from, with some stuff as a kid. I Let me tell you, I did not try to get away with a whole bunch of stuff because if ever I did, boy, did I not get away with it. <laughs> These Now, once again, my exposure to multicultural uh, backgrounds and families and that sort of thing is mostly through television and movies because, you know, I'm from uh, not the most diverse of places. <laughs> But this, this, these parents and this family dynamic, more than anything else I can think of, r- remind me of Kim's Convenience and Mr. Kim's relationship with his kids. And, you know, they're older at the time we're seeing Kim's Convenience, but I could imagine when his son and daughter were uh, Kamala's age that he was very much like Abu is here in this show. Yeah. Uh, okay. He- it's the uh- Pakistani Mr. Kim. That's what I want to call her. That. <laughs> now, <clears throat> let's, get to, let's get to an important por- part of this show. Uh, the 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 they say we will let you go to this thing. Which, by the way, let me tell you, when I was a kid, I was like uh, sixteen years old. Sixteen? No, maybe it was a fifth. Uh, no, no, I wasn't even that old. Eighth grade. How old are you in eighth grade? In the eighth grade, Wait. you're about fourteen. You're thirteen to fourteen. Yeah, we'll say I was thirteen. I think thirteen sounds right. Thirteen years old. I asked. I I asked my parents because I was just like, listen, I've never been to a concert before. But Green Day is coming to Charlotte. I would love to see them. Can can we make this happen? And they were like, "Not a chance. No way." <laughs> and like, and and I took it. I just I took it well, and I was just like, "Well, you know, I tried. Okay, whatever." And a couple days later, my mom was just like, "You know what? You were so mature about that because previously I would have blown up about it." She goes, "You were so mature about that. We're gonna actually let you go." And I, I I went and my dad went and had a we all had a good time together and everything. Hey, your dad went with you. Nice. Yeah, my dad and my friend uh, Matt. We we both went and like Matt was like the first. If I was thirteen, Matt was probably twelve. The first concert I went to was with no parental supervision. I was probably fifteen. I might have been fourteen, but I think it was fifteen. And it was Young MC and Millie Vanilli. Ooh, no adults around, so I was partying hard. I drank seven Dr. Peppers. <laughs> I think I think the next one that I had was all the way in like probably yeah, it was like fifteen, sixteen when somebody else could drive, and you know you'd end up going up to the. Uh, you know, I shifted, I shifted or gears abruptly. My second concert was uh, Poison and Warrant. So Woo, I tell you, man, you just kept on stepping up. Holy cow. I was all over the board. I haven't been to any concerts since. But when this dad comes in dressed up as the Hulk and then and we're giving the, the, the child a little Hulk costume. Oh, it's costume. also even painted his face green. The whole head, his big bald head and everything just top to bottom. I love dad so much at this moment. 
Oh, my heart broke for him. It oh, my so goodness. Sad. My heart broke for him when she said he looked ridiculous. And she doesn't understand how lucky she is. You know, my dad would would go to, to any comic book convention in the world with me right now if I asked. But when I was young, he didn't have time for that and wasn't interested in that. So when I was her age, if my dad had painted himself green, you better believe I would have been hopping to it. Yeah, it, it, it's so wild how like just the the small little things in life where somebody just goes like, oh, I would I would absolutely die. And another person would be like, I would die of happiness if that happened. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's a whole matter of perspective. Yeah, uh, but he it's so good. And, and I loved his just kind of he plays he plays that amazingly well. Just that that perfect dejected kind of thing. But yeah, I. It, oh, so good. So good. And, but again, I'm breaking though. Like I'm getting to that age where I'm on the side of the parents now. So oh yeah. You can't be, you can't, you can't sit there and watch that. And just like, you see dad's world just crumble because everything that we've seen from him in this one episode, this man loves the ever loving crap out of his family. Yes. He is all about it. He wants everybody to just be happy. <laughs> he and- loves two things, his family and his new, uh, uh, I don't know, is it like an Amazon Echo kind of thing? Yeah, it's an Echo like device and everything that I love that the nerd kit. And again, this is again, this is where we get to good story writing and stuff like that. Uh, different from other storytelling things that we'll be talking about in other shows that we do. Uh, but this show has good storytelling because with this little stupid device, you establish that oh, or whatever the kid's name is, is a uh, like he's that kind of tech genius and everything. He's yep. going to be able to do that. You're going to be able to control this stuff and so you can uh, set up the security system so when she can sneak out and every time it is just that fantastic storytelling where they're laying it out and making sure everything is there it motivates the story and motivates characters Th- again that's i was i was shocked at how good this show was well this show was written he even programmed it to to understand Urdu, I think he said. Oh my god. First of all, this kid needs to be just, you know, shot out of a cannon right now. No no one's this nice. <laughs> yes. No one's just be like, "Oh yeah, by the way, I I know I'm just some white kid that's got a crush on your uh, daughter and no one realizes it, but like which by the way, I, that kid's heart's going to get broken because like in that broken trailer so hard. in yeah. that trailer she, she like looks after a guy who clearly is like, you know, the cuter looking dude or whatever. And but you yeah. can just tell I'm like, "Oh, this kid, he's going to get it so hard because he is absolutely in love with her. Where was I going with this? Oh, the, the all, know, all, all, all of the all the echo stuff uh, is going to be just it's just great. Adding all of that in there just makes this show so much smarter than I, I frankly thought it was going to be. Well, man, uh, I think we've covered all the the hot buttons I wanted to talk about. Anything else with you, or should we figure out how this relates one to one to Sylvester Stallone? Well, thank you, Adam or Bruce. I have a prepared statement. Good evening, Mr. Stallone. Whispering. I'm not sure. Oh, wait. I think that's a a, hold on. Stage direction. I'm not Sean, and he's not your pal. He's just some dude. Back to normal voice. I would like to speak with you today about the talents of set decorator Kathy Orlando. In nerd circles, she's a big deal. She's one of two decorators on Miss Marvel, but she also is the decorator on HBO's Watchmen, one of the best superhero shows of the last decade. She was also the decorator on The Orville, WandaVision, and the King of Them All in every nerd's favorite film franchise. <laughs> Think like a man, too. I gotta check that one out. <laughs> Unlike some other silver-spooned daughter of fabulous wealth, Kathy Orlando started from humble beginnings. In 1998, she was a painter on something called Ka, the Sea Monster, and soon hustled her uh, way into Bayer, where she worked on movies like Big Fat Liar and A Mighty Wind. She would then go on to work in 2009's Iron Man, and she shot off like a rocket ship after that. But everyone in Hollywood is connected to you in some way, and Kathy Orlando is no different. In 2003, she worked on the TV show Las Vegas, which we've spoken about so many times on this show, I'm pretty sure I could say, hey, guess which TV show I'm about to reference, and the dirty babies out there would know exactly what show I was talking about. If you couldn't tell, I'm a big fan of Kathy Orlando. She's good at her job, and more importantly, she's a good lady. That's all I've got for this week. I hope you're doing well. I hope you didn't ask. Uh, I know you didn't ask, but I'm also doing well. Hope to hear from you soon. Your pal, your name here. Oh, I'm sorry. I think that uh, your pal, Adam.
Good job, Adam. Flawless. Execution. Perfect. Ah, thank you. I can only uh, hope to uh, not bring shame upon Sean and his family. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before we get to it, let's uh, let's break it down here, Bruce. Uh, what do you think about the first episode of Captain Marvel? Let's give it a Robin rating. And uh, do we want to? Do you? Are you interested in more? Have has they stoked yes. the fire enough within you to make you uh, come back for more Miss Marvel? I, I'm going to give this first episode to Tim Drake because I definitely want to come back to it. Not made for me, but I'm still curious. There's questions. I want to know the answer to, but I'm thinking I'll probably wait until it's pretty close to all being out because I'll get a little impatient with this particular one going week to week. So I think I'll probably wait a while and then watch a few episodes in a clump. I think this was a uh, a wise decision uh, for Disney and Marvel to put out one episode here, whereas a lot of the shows that we've been yeah. getting lately have been having, uh, you know, like a two episode open or something like that. Uh, it's nice to see it in one shot, and really, I think this is kind of that perfect, uh, that perfect pilot. That I think if we got another show behind it right away, it might have lessened how good this pilot actually is. Yeah, I think in terms of pilots, I've always said, at least for like genre f- stuff, that like the example of my all-time favorite pilot or first episode is stranger things and i think this captures a whole lot of that like this is a great first episode it, it lets you know what's up but it leaves you really wanting to the de- to find out the answer to a whole lot of questions yeah here's, here's you feeling good and nostalgic in a couple of ways yeah here's the world that we've built look at how everything works let us kind of lay all the the you know pieces on the table to let you know who everybody is where they stand within this universe and everything and how this story is basically going to kick off and once you get that in you're like oh perfect oh and by the way we didn't talk about this did you see the uh, quote unquote after credits it's, I'll call it a mid credit really is what it is I did see that um, I, and I have no idea what that organization is is that supposed to be like S.H.I.E.L.D. Jr. or S.H.I.E.L.D.'s gone now what are they so the guy that you're looking at there was a guy who actually interrogated Peter Parker and his family and stuff all of those people in Spider in the last Spider-Man film in the the no way home no way home yeah i don't even remember an interrogation scene so That's how well you I remember am. when they got they got them all in there and like ned starts admitting everything and then they're like oh, oh okay. yeah you didn't have yeah. to say that yeah. so yeah i knew I, you remember then because ned ned's yes. the best <laughs> um but so that guy was in there he was in that spider-man stuff and uh word on the internet is is people have their suspicions that that dude may be a scroll or a Kree yeah. or something like that. You never know. For, for a while there, there was a scroll in the end credits of everything. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. But, and, and we got uh, Secret Invasion Secret coming invasion up. Secret Invasion coming up any day now. So, so, you know, there's there's plenty of that stuff to go around. So, um, did I say it? Uh, Tim Drake for me uh, sure. for this first yeah. one. Uh, but I, I enjoy it uh, a lot more than I had initially thought because, I don't know, you, new new stuff is tough sometimes where you're just like, we're going to have to talk about this on a podcast. Please don't be a thing that wastes, you know, an hour of my time. And it, and this didn't. I was so pleasantly I, surprised about it because I am not its target audience and uh, qu- quite impressed. And, uh, you know, it's looking like our Young Avengers is going to be a female driven team. So far, the three most obvious candidates are Kate Bishop, America Chavez and now Kamala Khan. Yeah. So it could be an interesting uh, female-driven team. I, I don't know who else would round it out, but I think it would work best if they had a core of four and then some peripheral characters the way the Avengers did. So yeah. one more person, and we're good to go. And they've uh, and they've been talking about all the Thunderbolt stuff, and we're like, well, what's who knows how any of this stuff's going to happen, man? So much, uh, so much neat stuff going on in Marvel, and of course, uh, we'll be talking about this more when that comes up uh, at the end of this season of Miss Marvel, and uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, next week, I think we talked about it previously. Uh, if if I do it wrong, we'll probably edit it this out. But uh, I think next week we're going to be talking about uh, Umbrella Academy. Yeah, is that back? Uh, probably. Is that back? Wow. I think it's back. Uh, stuff is like just catching me off guard. Well, I don't know. Let me just check real quickly. So you check that. I feel while like I heard somebody talk about it recently. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. I, I remember having a conversation about. I was curious how Elliot Page's character was going to play out. 
so June twenty second. June twenty second is the premiere. So not this weekend, but the next. We'll do it the week after. So we'll figure out what we're doing here, and that's why you go get the. Uh, that's why you go over to patreoncom slash HMP. You get pre show, post show, in the Dinger Zone, and you get to hear the things that we should have figured out before the show. So if we don't figure it out before the show, we'll figure it out after the show. And then the people that are behind the Patreon, guess what? They get to check it out. They'll know. They'll know before you will. Huh? Huh? What do you think about that? That's a clever, clever girl. How much you head on down to the Patreon dog, there, doggone it. Links in the show notes. Uh, Bruce, where can we find more of your work on the internet? OB won 30 questions. As the title suggests, it's a show where we ask 30 questions about Obi Wan Kenobi on Disney Plus. And uh, we were going to do an episode of the film fine with me and Bruce this week, but I got COVID for a couple of days, so that was a bummer. But we'll be doing that very soon. Uh, we got I think some we'll uh, pick back up the last week of June if that works for you. I'm off work yeah. starting the last week. We'll of June. we'll get some stuff coming up soon. But if you want a preview of of that, you can actually go over to uh, again patreoncom HMP. We talk about we review two movies or at least a movie uh, for you while we're. Uh, that out. That is it, everybody. Join us next week for the absolute sweet Sean to go back to the internet. Bruce Lesley, I'm Matt Porter. Stay super, everybody. Goodbye, Marty and Edie. I've been burned for the last time.